just jump right in and pray. Um, if you would bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us to worship you. Um, it is good for us to be here today, and it's good for us to hear from you because we need to hear what you say. Uh, we, need, we need your gospel to do a work in our hearts. Um, so, Father, as I present the gospel to your people, Father, would you not let it harden our hearts, um, but would you soften our hearts to receive this good news? Father, would you transform us from the inside out for our good and your glory in Jesus' name? Amen. Well, we've been um, going through this sermon series called The Sacred Life. This is the second week of the series. And, and really the main thrust of this series is to show us how gospel doctrine, what we believe, creates a gospel culture. It influences the way that we live. Now, those words, I'm sure we're all kind of familiar with them, but when they're kind of put together like that, it might seem a little abstract. So I wanna break it down real, real carefully. When I say gospel doctrine, what I'm talking about is the absolute truths that scripture clearly articulates about what God has done through Jesus Christ to forgive sin and to give new life to all who put their trust in Jesus, right? This grace that we receive, this love from the Father that we receive is dynamic and it changes who we are. It's more than just an assurance that we'll go to heaven when we die. It's more than just a little bit of life, like a little bit of life transformation. This is absolutely revolutionary to the way, to the to who we are. It changes us completely. And because the, the gospel radically changes who we are, it changes our identity down at the core because of grace, it radically changes the way that we live, our rhythms of everyday life. Now, this is how gospel culture is created. When people who have received a new identity in Christ are actually living out of these identities, this identity, and when gospel doctrine and gospel culture meet and are embodied within the local church, it is a powerful witness to and demonstration of God's power in and through his people. And this is incredibly attractive to the watching world. So here's where I'm going this morning. I have two points. The first point is this, that the gospel radically changes who you are, that you get a whole new identity so that you can become a child of God. And the second point is this, in light of your new identity, you find yourself as part of God's family and the way that you live is radically different. So these two things, they're inextricably connected because the gospel doctrine that speaks of our adoption as God's children also tells us that we're supposed to live within the context of God's family. And as I walk through these two points, what I want to show you, what I hope to show you, my prayer is to show you how you become a child of God and what it's like to live in that family. So go ahead, open up your Bibles. We're in Ephesians chapter two, and we're gonna dig right in to this gospel doctrine, what God has done for us. Chapter two, verse one. And you were dead. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, I have a Bible reading plan that I follow, uh, and maybe you have a Bible reading plan too. Um, if you're reading a Bible plan that is uh, inspirational and motivational scriptures, these three verses, I guarantee you, are not in that Bible reading plan. They're not going to be there. You won't find them. Because these, these verses, what they show us is, is it's very sobering, and, and it really what it does, it, it's it presents a very unflattering reality of our condition as humans and the destructive nature of sin. So I wanna show you just how unflattering sin is and the consequences it brings. And we don't have to go far in this verse to show it. And right away, we're told that sin kills you, kills you dead. Eventually, sin will kill you physically. I, I officiated my first funeral this past week and I was just reminded all week long of the destructive nature of sin, right? 
illness, mental illness, cancer, disease, sickness, and ache. Sin has a physical effect on our bodies. Sin causes these things, and because of these things, sin invented the grave. But it's not just this physical death that's a reality. There's a spiritual death that's been in effect since the day that we're born. Even though we came out of the delivery room screaming and with a heartbeat, our, our hearts, our spiritual hearts, were lifeless. There was no beat in them. This is what Paul is talking about here when he says this happens by nature, that we are born disconnected from God and in sin. Sin is death. It cuts us off from experiencing this vibrant spiritual life that God intended for us to live as humans. And because we're born cut off from God, we live as if we're cut off from God. Or another way to say it, because we're born in sin, we live in sin. Now, what is sin? Many of us, many of us think of sin as this big uh, moral no-no right? Drunkenness, murder, sexual immorality. But the way the Bible talks about sin, sin is something much more than that. It goes far deeper than these things. Sin is actively rejecting the life that God has had for you in order to pursue your own a life on your own terms. I'll say that again. Sin is actively rejecting the life that God has for you in order to pursue life on your own terms. And it isn't so much as a blatant rejection of God where we try to tuck God in a closet and say, hey, don't come out until I ask for you to come out. It's more of a, a subtle shift in pursuing my preferences over God's preferences. All right? And this, this is our default, default mode of operation. Rather than God being the center of your life, which will lead ultimately to a full and happy life, you put yourself at the center you make your life all about you, what you want, what advances you, what makes you feel good. And this is what Paul is saying in verse three when he says, sin leads us to pursue the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind. And this is what Paul also makes clear here, that the pursuit of our flesh and mind and body leads us towards a destructive path. Paul says, in sinning, we follow the course of the world. Ever since Adam and Eve pursued the passions of their flesh in Genesis 3, the course of the world has been that of a steep downward spiral of things just completely falling apart. And because our first parents have rejected the truth about God and and, and they subjected themselves to the lies of Satan, now we too follow in their footsteps. Verse two says, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That is in effect within us. Another thing we need to see here from this passage is that that this thing about sin, the destructive nature, the way that we do it, the passions of our flesh, it also tells us that it's true of everyone, that no one is exempt from this spiritual deadness. Church, this means that some of your your friends, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors, even people in this room are spiritually dead right now. That they have no spiritual heartbeat. But we cannot forget that this letter that Paul writes to the, the, to the Ephesians is written to Christians. And Paul says to them, you, church, you were once dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked. Christians, just like those who are currently spiritually dead, you were once that way too. And if you're a Christian, Paul does not want you to forget this. He doesn't want you to forget where you've come from. He does the same thing in 1 Corinthians 6, where he he rattles off a list of people who are living life their own way, pursuing the passions of the flesh. He says, the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, swindlers. And then he looks to the church and he says, and such were some of you. 
At this point, at this point, you might be thinking, wow, Sam, you're really coming at it today. You're being really harsh, a little heavy-handed. We're only three minutes into this, and you're yelling at me. You know, and if this is your first time in a church in a long time, or maybe ever, you're probably thinking, well, this is why I don't come. All he does is he tells me what's wrong with me. You know, others of you, maybe, maybe you're on the opposite end of that. Maybe you know. You feel. You feel this. It's like, I know I'm not a good person. I know the shady things that I've done. I know the dark thoughts that I've had this week. But before you start tuning me out, what I want to let you know is that the understanding, that understanding the problem of sin and the degree of our need is the first step in finding the cure, and the cure has been given to us in the gospel. Right, this first step, understanding sin, our neediness, this is why Paul tells us that we're spiritually dead. He doesn't say we're crippled or we're sickly. We're not slightly misguided. We don't just need to try harder or do better. Paul says we need to be resurrected. We were dead. We were dead and we were children of wrath. Let that, let that sink in. Let me ask you, does this humble you, Christian? Or do you think that God saved you because you could be some sort of an asset to his team? Many of us think that way. Oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I've got a lot of money or I'm a pretty charismatic guy. I can, you know, maybe God can use me. I'm a good asset. But here's the thing. A corpse is useless. The helpless reality of our sinful condition should develop a deep humility within us. So Paul lays all this out in the first three verses of, of Ephesians 2. He says, man, it's, everybody's plagued with sin. It's destructive. It'll lead you down the wrong path. It's pursuing the old thing, things that you want to do. He says all of this, and then he continues to, to verse 4. But God. Now, if you really believe that you are indeed the type of person that Paul just described in verses one through three, if you believe that you are dead in your sins and a child of wrath, these are the two greatest words that you could ever hear. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This right here, friends, is pure gospel goodness. This is good news. In verse four, Paul tells us that God has intervened we were headed down this downward spiral and God swooped in like a superhero and rescued us. Oh, thank God. But the richness of this text, this passage continues as Paul tells us the motivation behind God's action. It is his mercy which is spurred on due to his great love with which he loved us. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. In 1 John, we're told that God is love. It is the essence of God. God cannot be God without love. It is him, okay? And we're also told in Scripture, throughout Scripture, that God is eternal, from eternity past to eternity future. We're also told that he's omnipresent, that God is everywhere. There's not a place in creation where God's presence isn't. And scripture also tells us that God is infinite, that he cannot be exhausted. So if God is love and God is uh, omnipresent, if God is infinite and God is eternal, that is the way his love is. He cannot be exhausted. God's love is literally unfathomable. We cannot measure it. We cannot calculate it. It's so great. And I love how beautifully this is articulated in the third verse of the hymn titled, The Love of God. I've, I've got the lyrics here. I want you to take a look at it. This is what's written. 
Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole those stretched from sky to sky. This is how great, how enormous God's love is. But look, it doesn't just say that God has this massive love. It says that God took this massive love and he directed it at us. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Look, here's the deal. God isn't stingy with his love. God's not stingy. And many of us think this. You can tell it in the way that you love other people, the way that you bless other people. You're a little bit withholding because you think God's withholding. God's not that way. Or maybe you think God's more apathetic toward you than he is loving. But this isn't what this passage tells us. God is setting his love on dead people. People like you and me. And through the gospel, he is making them alive for no other reason than the fact that God loves you. We didn't earn it. We didn't make ourselves worthy recipients of this love. God sets his love on the undeserving. And let me caution you, as soon as you start thinking that God owes you something, you are forgetting that you were dead and that he resurrected you by grace. You're diminishing the extravagance of God's love. When we, can see, when we, when we convince ourselves that we deserve something from God because we're moral people or because we go to church or because we give to the church or because we volunteer or because we're good parents or because whatever reason, we are minimizing our sin and we're being dishonest. We're saying, you know what? I really wasn't dead. I'm actually a pretty good person. I've, I've got a little bit of spiritual life in me. I just need a, a good jump start from God. He, helped, he had to help me out a little bit. That's what we're saying. But as Paul says in verses one through three, that's not the case. You were dead, a child of wrath. And as a child of wrath, we see that what we deserve is eternal punishment for actively and passively pursuing the passions of flesh. As a child of wrath, what we deserve is judgment. And if you see yourself this way, you will know that apart from grace, you are completely undeserving of anything good. Now, here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. As soon as you see that, then you will see how extravagant God's love is. You'll see how he pours out his love like a tsunami on undeserving people. Verse 5 testifies that even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Here's the thing. God's love isn't set on, those, on people who see themselves as deserving. God's love is exclusively for the undeserving. The only kind of Christian in the world is an undeserving person who has encountered God's radical love. And this love is so powerful, it reverses the downward spiral of the world. It's so powerful that it gives us new desires, so powerful that we're no longer under the control of Satan, but it's God's love that compels us. It's so powerful that it takes our deadness and it makes us alive. That's the power of this love. And when Paul says that we've been made alive together with Christ, he's talking about the new life caused by new birth into a new family. Because not only does Paul say that we're saved by grace through Christ's substitutionary death on the cross, but we are raised up with Christ and seated in the heavenly places. Paul, what Paul is referring to here is a great exchange that happens where Jesus takes your place so that you can have his. So that you can get everything in he you can get heaven and everything heaven has to offer, including his heavenly father. And this is made clear in John 1, verses 12 and 13. I'll read it to you. But to all who did receive him, he's saying all who did have faith in Jesus, 
All who trust him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What this passage tells us is that for all those who trust in Jesus for their right standing before God, the people who have no confidence in their flesh or their own ability, they are adopted and given the right to become children of God. And again, we are told right here in John, this isn't a work of man. This, we did not will ourselves to be this. We did not you know, gather up the energy to become a child of God. This is a gift that comes only through God's grace. Now I want you to think back to the Ephesians 2 passage where he says that we are children of wrath. Or Jesus puts it this way in John 8, that we are children of the devil and we're imitating the devil. We're imitating our, our, our father by pursuing the desires of the flesh. But then here we're told By the grace of God, he sets his love on undeserving people and he brings us into his family, into God's family. And Romans 8 tells us that those who trust in Christ have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now theologians call this the doctrine of adoption. The Westminster Larger Catechism states it like this. I put it up on a screen so you can follow along. Adoption is an act of the free grace of God in and for his only son, Jesus Christ, whereby all those that are justified are received into the number of his children, having his name put upon them, the spirit of his son given to them, and are under his fatherly care and dispensations, admitted to all the liberties and privileges of the sons of God, and made heirs to the promises and fellow heirs with Christ in glory." See, gospel doctrine tells us that we were dead and we've been made alive. The doctrine of adoption tells us that we were once sons and daughters of the devil and now we are children of God. This is one of the most beautiful truths of the Christian faith. We're not just forgiven of our sins, but we're given a new identity. We're given a new family. And the implications of this are astounding. And I want to show you three implications, three ways to look at this, that being part of God's family will completely transform the way you live. The first one is this, that being adopted means that we're, that we have God as our heavenly father. And before I start building this out, I realize some of us, this can be incredibly difficult for us to understand let alone to engage in this relationship with our Heavenly Father because the way that we view God as our Heavenly Father is often influenced by the men who acted as our earthly fathers. Now for some of of us, God has blessed us with great dads who loved and guided guided us imperfectly, but to the best of their ability. While many have had dads who failed tremendously, Perhaps they've abandoned, abused, or neglected you. And so if you're in that category, I just want to express to you my deepest apologies because you, you were sinned against. You were robbed of a relationship that was meant to point you toward your heavenly father, not to deter you from him. So it's with great tenderness that I proceed. And I hope that your view of your heavenly father will change in a way that allows you to offer forgiveness. I know I don't say that lightly, but your view of God will be so enormous that you'll be able to offer grace and forgiveness to your earthly father. So I have three things that I want to commend to you about God as your heavenly father that offers great freedom. And it's that he's honest, that he's loving, and he's safe. First is that our Heavenly Father is honest. He's honest about what we're like. He doesn't sugarcoat our situation. He doesn't try to portray us in a better light. He calls it like it is. We saw that in Ephesians 2. We're told that we're dead in our sins. He doesn't say we're crippled, disabled, mildly handicapped. He says we are dead. That's his honest assessment of our condition. 
And at the same time, God is unabashedly honest about our condition. We find that we are intensely loved. Remember that great love with which he loved us? That's what we find. This is the magnificent thing about grace. We don't deserve to be loved by God, but he does so anyway. He shows us that even while we're at our worst, he loves us. God finds us in the grave and loves us to the heavens. Because of these two things, that God is honest, that he's loving, we know that we're safe with our heavenly father. He isn't waiting for us to mess up so we can, he can freak out on us or try to manipulate us back into right behavior. The Father loves us at our worst and he makes us alive with Christ and seats us in heavenly places. And here's the thing I know about Jesus. Jesus is King of kings, Lord of lords, right now sitting at the right hand of God. That's where he'll be forever. Jesus isn't going anywhere and neither are we if our faith is on Christ. So we find ourselves safe and secure with our Heavenly Father. Romans 8 gives us confidence and security knowing that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God creates a safe space for us. And when you see your heavenly father as honest and loving and offering security and safety, this changes the way you live because it gives us the ability to be honest with ourselves. It allows us to admit our shortcomings and our neediness. It allows us to admit our wrong and confess our sins, knowing that grace and love awaits those who are in Christ. Gosh, guys, for the last seven months, this is what God has just been railing me with. Because now, if that's true, it means now I don't have to try to prove myself anymore. It means I don't have to compete for my father's attention. I already have it. I don't have to protect, self-protect myself. I don't have to self-justify. You don't either. You don't have to get your act together because you are loved even when you're at your worst. And there's nothing you can do to stop God's love from being dumped on you. So that's what happens when we see God as our father. It's beautiful. The next thing is we see Jesus as our older brother. We sang about that today. And the first time that I heard the song, I, you know, it kind of made sense to me, but it's like, what, what do you mean, Jesus, my older brother? Let me tell you. At the beginning of Mark's gospel, Jesus is, he's preaching. There's people sitting at his feet listening to him preaching about the kingdom of God. And he's told that his mother and his brothers are looking for him. And, and he says, well, who are my mother and my brothers? And he looks down around him who is listening to him preach. And he says, he says this, he says, here are my mother and my brothers. For everyone who does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. And right here, Jesus is redefining family. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But Jesus, what he's saying here is that we are his little brothers and sisters. Now, older siblings are instructors at life for younger siblings. They show them how to live by setting an example. I know that that's true. Uh, I'm an older brother, I've got two younger brothers. I know, but here's the thing, I know that there's things that I, I set the example for my brothers to walk in the right way, but I know more than that, there's things that I taught my brothers to avoid, right? I, I did something foolish and they see my consequences that I face for doing something dumb. And so they say, you know what? I'm not gonna take the same path Sam took. I'm gonna do something different. And the same is true of our older brother setting the example. Only Jesus did everything right. He didn't make mistakes, do anything foolish. Jesus lived the perfect life and he set an example for us what it looks like to honor God and to love others. And at the same time, Jesus lived perfectly. Hebrews 2 tells us that Jesus became like his brothers in every respect. This means that Jesus walked in our shoes he faced all the temptations we face. He lived in the world we live in. Jesus knows exactly what our world is like. He knows what it's like to work long days. Moms, he knows what it's like to have people wanting things from you all the time. He experienced the same kind of weakness and limitations that we experience. Jesus is an older brother who relates to us. But Jesus isn't just an older brother who can relate to us, who sets an example for us. Jesus is a better brother than that. 
In the Hunger Games, there's this national event that takes place each year where 12 kids called Tributes are selected at random to essentially fight to the death in this nationally televised event called the Hunger Games. And it's, they're at the annual, at the beginning of the movie, they're at this, this annual ceremony um, where, where they're lined up to hear who these tributes are going to be. And uh, this lottery drawing happens, and they call the name um, Primrose Everdeen. And she's this young, innocent, sweet little girl. And, and you know that this, this fight, this battle that she's going to be up against, it's not going to go well for her. This, th- for this little girl, her death is certain. And in this moment of complete selflessness, her older sister, Katniss Everdeen, volunteers to go in her place, sparing her sister from, from, from experiencing such a terrible thing. And this is exactly what our older brother Jesus has done for us. He saw you and me up against certain death that sin brings, and he put himself on the cross in our place. This is why the cross is such a big deal for for Christians. For Jesus, it meant his rejection. When he became our sin, he he was rejected. He was set aside. But for the Christian, the cross is a sign of our acceptance. We know that because Jesus was pushed out, we are brought in. This is the kind of older brother Jesus is, one who lays down his life for his younger siblings. And as we look at what Jesus done, as we see his, has done, as we see his sacrifice, as we see his humility, as we understand his power made perfect in weakness, we are transformed. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of us. He's directing our eyes toward Jesus, and in doing so, we become like our older brother. So that everything good about you and me is because of what Jesus has done but it keeps getting better. That's, that's what happens with Christ. It just keeps getting better. Not only will we be like him, but we will have everything our older brother has. Because of Christ's work and the faith that God gives us to trust in that work, we are made heirs with Christ. And this means that we'll, we'll inherit heaven and everything in it. And we'll have direct access to our adoptive heavenly father. For us to call God our Heavenly Father would be absurd if it weren't for what Christ has done and that he would command us to pray, our Father who art in heaven. The doctrine of adoption changes the way that we see Jesus. He isn't just a good moral teacher. He's not just a good example. He's our older brother who lays his life down for us. And the third way third thing that changes when we understand that we've been adopted into God's family is the fact that the church is now our family. If I'm adopted into God's family and you're adopted into God's family, guess what? We're brothers and sisters. We're part of the same family together. In the profession of faith today, 1 Peter 2 says that you were once not a people, but now you are God's people. It doesn't say you were once not a person and now you are God's person. Uh Uh-uh. That's singular. What, what What the Bible says is plural. You're now part of a family. Our faith in Jesus doesn't just save us so we can experience God all by ourselves. It means that God is meant to be experienced within the context of his family. This has been God's intention since the beginning. All throughout scripture, you can see God making a people for himself a distinct people, a people who's to represent to the world what God is like. So to be part of God's family makes us different from the world. Ray Ortland says it like this. The gospel doesn't just make us a new community. The gospel makes us a whole new kind of community. And here's a few ways that God's family is different from anything else. The first thing is to be part of God's family means that we are radically committed to the gospel. It means that we're radically committed to God's word and to his plan of redemption. It means that we study God's word together. It means that we listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do. Rather than following the passions of the flesh, living the life that we see fit, we follow God's leading through his word and through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Right? This is contrary to any other sort of community that's out there right now. We follow God 
his word. We're committed to the gospel. The second thing means that God's family is diverse. The gospel is for all people. And so that must be reflected in the church. Sacred City ought to be compromised of every kind of people represented in the Quad Cities. That's our prayer. Because the gospel is for all people. This means that we should be diverse racially, socioeconomically, and generationally. All because our identity is in Christ and that radically unifies us. There are no more walls of hostility. There's no barriers anymore. We've been unified in Christ. The next thing we see is that the church is radically committed to one another. This means extending the love that we've received from our Heavenly Father and distributing it to each other. It means that we're gracious and patient with one another. It means that there's a depth to a relationship that goes beyond the superficial. Being committed to one another means that we're in this for the long haul. We're willing to enter one another's mess for the purpose of seeing God's redemption unfold. As people are honest about the messiness of their life, they are loved when they're at their worst just as much as they are at their best. Rhythms, it means we, we eat together. We spend time together. We celebrate together. We see each other often. As God's family, we suffer together. We bear one another's burdens. Because all of the love in God's family, we are compelled to be generous towards others and help meet others' needs. Financially, through affirming words, by giving our time, skills, and energy. Right? We're radically committed to each other in a way that honestly doesn't make sense. And finally, God's family ought to be the happiest people on earth because they have received the greatest gift ever known to mankind. Salvation in Christ and adoption into God's family. What we have received, we could never earn ourselves. And God continues to grow us into this big, happy family as we live on mission together. And we'll talk about that more next week. And I could keep going on and on about what it's like to live in the family of God, but th- hopefully these few things start to paint a picture of what it's like to be God, part of God's family. But here, let me tell you this, that as soon as, we, as soon as we minimize the gospel, as soon as the gospel starts becoming small in our eyes, the experience of family life will become shallow and superficial. When the gospel isn't central, The church loses its distinctiveness. Instead of a place of honesty, it becomes a place of concealing weakness and putting up a front. Instead of a place of love, it becomes places where people are prideful and and condescending. Instead of a joyful place, it becomes a place of rigid rule following. It becomes lifeless. If we, as a church, want to experience the fullness of what it means to live in God's family, we must remain radically committed to the gospel because it's the gospel that brings us into, the God, into God's family, but it's also the gospel that keeps us in God's family. Because things are hard. People's lives are messy. I'm messy. You're messy. If there's one thing I know about you, I know you're messy. And it's hard, but it's God's grace in the gospel that keeps us committed to one another because God is so committed to us. As I close, I, I want to bring this up. There's, there's probably no better place in the Bible to look to see these things than Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. This is a passage that Pastor Justin preached on last week, but it's worth revisiting. This is a place where we can clearly see people living out their new identity in Christ through their weekly rhythms. We're told that in understanding the gospel, understanding what God has done to adopt them into their family, a gospel family is formed. They devote themselves to the fellowship. They devote themselves to one another, to community. They ate together. They shared things together. They were selling possessions to meet the needs of one another. They worshiped together. They lived on mission together. We clearly see that the gospel produces a sense of togetherness that defies the norms of culture. 
And you might be thinking, maybe, but times have changed. We're much busier now. Our culture is so much different. You know, maybe you're thinking, you know, that was a special movement of the spirit way back then. It's probably not ever gonna happen again. But friends, what we see in Acts 2 was never intended to be a one-time deal. It was never meant to be a historical event that we just refer back to. The same spirit that is at work in the church back then is at work in this church right now and is moving us towards this type of community, to this type of family. The spirit is making a community that displays our Heavenly Father to the rest of the world. A community of honesty, people who are honest about their sin, people who, rather than concealing their weakness, aren't ashamed to admit it. A community of humility rather than self-justification. The Spirit is making a community of love and grace. People know that only by the work of Jesus we are brought into this family and more love than we ever dare to dream. People who share this love with one another. The Spirit is making this community of safety where rather than judgment, people are loving each other when they're at their worst and walking with people through difficult times. People who are radically committed to one another even when it's inconvenient. And at Sacred City Church, this type of community, this, this sort of environment is really embodied within the context of our missional community where 12 to 25, depending on how big the group is, people commit their life to living with one another. Not like in the same house, but living life together, life on life stuff here, right? Where we eat together, we celebrate together, we pray and study God's word together. We are blessed by each other and we serve one another and where we live on mission together, where we're honest and we can grow in our faith together. Now, if you're not yet a Christian, and you are looking for this type of honest, loving, and safe community, if you desire what it's like to know what it's like to to be loved by your heavenly Father when you're at your worst, if you desire to have an older brother who shows you how much he loves you and how much he wants you to, to live a great life, lays down his life for you, All you have to do is put your trust in Jesus. Trust two things. One, first, that you really were dead in your sins. You were lifeless. And to trust that God really does love you that much, that he would send his son to die for you and adopt you into his family. For those of you who are Christians and you've maybe found yourself um, bouncing from church to church or maybe you're coming out of season where you haven't been in a church for a while, I wanna invite you to see how we live as God's family within the context of missional community. Come and see how God is taking imperfect people and just dumping all kinds of love on them and leading them to a fuller, happy life. There's a, uh, a map of all of our MCs back in the entryway. Find a missional community that's near you and come and see. We'd love for you to join us in community and on mission. And for those of you who are already part of God's family, who are living in community and on mission, I want to urge you, friends, brothers and sisters, to carry on. Keep close to your heavenly Father. Draw near to him. Have no confidence in yourself, but rely entirely on Christ's finished work. And follow the Spirit as you come to know more and more what it's like to live in the family of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, thank you, God, that we can call you Heavenly Father. To know that we were once children of wrath. You've acted in such a gracious, generous way that you have loved us with the great love with which you had and you've adopted us into your family. Father, would you help this, help us understand this truth of the gospel that we were once dead and now we're made alive. We were once um, in this terrible family led by Satan and now we're in God's family and you're li- leading us to live as such. Would you help us? Would you enable us to do so?
Father, this is good news. Help us to treat it as such. Would you grow our hearts and affections for you in that way? Would you help us to see you as our heavenly father, to see Jesus as our older brother, and to see the church as our family? In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.